Uh, just a couple of subjects today. Uh, we're going to do Rayleigh and Raman scattering, spontaneous processes, fairly weak. And then after that, we're going to talk about coherent anti Stokes Raman spectroscopy. And then we're going to be done. So, Rayleigh and Raman. Once again, we're going we're to repeat so, a few of the things we said in the introduction and put more detail into it and show some results. So we're going to talk about Rayleigh scattering measurements and then a little bit about Raman scattering and then show some Raman scattering in turbulent flames and then uh, a little bit about Raman and IC engines, but uh, no, we're going to talk about Rayleigh and IC engines. But I also wanted to show you some recent Raman results that uh, I didn't include them in the uh, notes because it was for a paper that was under review for the symposium and I was one of the reviewers and uh, I knew, so I knew about it but it wasn't actually public so I didn't include it here but I'll, I'll shut that down and show you a few cool Raman results uh, uh, from that work also. So Rayleigh scattering is a non-resonant elastic as in the frequency huh you know it's, it's almost <laughs> it's almost impossible to edit your own work have you noticed that you know what you meant to say and so you read right past the thing that's wrong and you don't also I type with three fingers you know so that that doesn't help uh, new Rayleigh is the same as the laser sorry there's another one in here that I caught this morning, so when I see it, I'll call attention to it. See, the, when you'd only type with three fingers, unfortunately, the temptation is to copy and paste a lot. Uh, it's spatially resolved and strong enough for imaging. Normally, it's a pulse technique in the gas phase. In fact, I think it's only used in the gas phase. Linear technique. It's background free if the laser does not accidentally excite fluorescence uh, also or in, uh, if me dro from drops and particles is avoided for example if you have an intense uh, 532 nanometer pulse uh, sometimes you can accidentally excite C2 swan bands in a rich flame and so you get a little bit of C2 fluorescence at very close to the same wavelength so be a little bit careful about that the other thing is if there are particles present, you may not see LII with your eye, but there might be some LII there anyway. And so if you're getting like a strong, strong signal and you're not doing a whole lot of uh, bandpass filtering, uh, you might want to try that and make sure you've killed off. If you think there's particles in there, you might want to kill that off. And one way to, um, one way to, to see if there's LII is that it has a longer lifetime than LIF. So if you kind of delay the camera to the point where LIF should have died and you're seeing a, a, a real signal there, that might be LII as well. Anyway, it's a way to detect density and temperature if the pressure is assumed constant. Raman, see I was copying and pasting. Raman is a non-resonant inelastic, those aren't equal to each other, scattering technique. It's uh, spectroscopic, but it does not directly change populations in the energy levels. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So uh, a spectroscopic technique would be like fluorescence or absorption, where you actually move population from one level to another level. That won't happen here. It's spatially resolved, uh, but it's too weak to allow imaging in most cases. This paper I'm going to show you is uh, a Raman image. Uh, normally it's a pulse technique for the gas phase. Linear technique scales with irradiance. It, uh, it's not necessarily background free because you're going to get this Rayleigh signature very close to it. You have to get rid of that. Um, and that's not so easy to, to suppress. And then you might also have these, uh, these issues with uh, swan band fluorescence or LII or something like that. But it's a nice way to detect multiple major species and temperature in a single shot. So we get elastically scattered Rayleigh light uh, very intensely at the laser frequency, which is what this spike is supposed to show, and then Raman scattering at uh, uh, much weaker. 
And as I said before, this is, we've already talked about uh, mixing yesterday when we were talking about locking amplifiers and also when we talked about mode locking. And obviously it's an analogy that I like. In this case, you have this dipole that's in action and it's going to mix with the carrier. The carrier is Rayleigh there. How does it mix? Well, the carrier has an electric field in it and we're talking about a dipole interaction. So it's like an RF mixer. We put sidebands on the carrier and we get those Raman curves. So the Raman signature comes from all of the rotational vibrational transitions in a Raman active molecule. So it's possible to detect uh, some species simultaneously and I'll show you some results of that. The Raman response is usually very weak. So it's possible to detect only major species and usually at a single point or along a line. Uh, there was one case where uh, Marshall Long at Yale uh, built a really big uh, um, flash lamp pump dye laser system. These things were massive dye cannons and they, they set up the intracavity beam so that it would be, uh, they used different optics inside the cavity and they set up the intracavity beam so it would be planar shaped. And they actually, and I remember I told you yesterday how uh, the, the irradiance inside the cavity is so much higher than what comes out. They actually put uh, very, th because they weren't optimizing the laser output, they put very low transmission mirror on the output coupler, so there was huge amount of intracavity irradiance inside the cavity, and then they put a flame inside there, and they actually had some not great Raman images in a flame, but that was because the irradiance was so high inside the cavity. Um, I, don't, I don't normally recommend sticking live things inside laser cavities because then the laser will we'll do things you didn't anticipate. Usually, lasers are kind of amazing. The, the modes will run away from something like that and do something else. Like, for example, if you try to do absorption inside a cavity, there's a chance that everything will just run away from the absorption line and oscillate somewhere else. So I don't recommend doing that, but that is one case I know of where people actually were able to uh, get a fairly weak image using Raman in a flame. If you look at the entire vibrational manifold, you can get the temperature just with Boltzmann statistics. So when the frequencies are shifted lower, they're more red, those are called Stokes bands, and when they're shifted bluer, they're called anti-Stokes. And you can calibrate the system using some, some species there that's uh, in large quantities and you know it, like nitrogen. Uh, what's the usual energy per pulse for Raman? As much as you can get. I'm going to show you a picture of a system from uh, Sandia Labs and uh, the point there is that if you try to put all of the energy into one pulse it, it, it'll break down, you'll get electric breakdown in the dielectric breakdown in the gas and it'll, it'll blow through windows and things like that. So uh, the, the Sandia system uses four lasers so they get multiple pulses that they add together or what people do if they have a single laser with a huge amount of energy per pulse they'll actually split the, the pulse up into maybe four pulses and then recombine them into a burst. So that they don't, they, uh, this, is a, this is a linear technique, so it really just matters uh, how many total photons you have. So it's okay to split that up into a, a, a train of pulses that have lower energy so they don't break down and they don't break windows and things like that. So you try to get as much energy into it as you can get, but you have to avoid causing problems. Other questions? Well, so you can combine it with LIF and I will show you an example of that from Sandia. And uh, you can use the uh, Raman to uh, scale the LIF for changes in quencher species. So let's imagine you, you're just trying to look at, at relative LIF. If you're looking, for example, in a non-premixed flame, which is what Rob Barlow looks at, you can radically change the quencher species uh, with time and position. So uh, even then, you probably should scale your LIF measurements, even though they're not quantitative, they may just be relative, you should still scale them if there are radical changes in the quencher species around it, and that's what he does with the Raman signal. So for Rayleigh scattering, you remember that we had this expression for the uh, uh, power that's emitted uh, into different uh, solid angles, given by this where nu is the frequency, n is the index of refraction, number density of scatterers, and so on. And we get this torus-shaped 
scattering pattern. And I showed you this before. This is from uh, Jonathan Frank at Sandia. It's planar Rayleigh imaging of temperature, assuming constant pressure, which is, that's fine in this case. And as I said, this is a case where he purposely mixed the gases so that they had all the gas mixtures across this flame had roughly the same Rayleigh cross section, so he didn't have to worry about radical changes in Rayleigh cross section across the flame. And these are some of the best uh, Rayleigh results I've seen, which is why I put them in here. Here's an example from a friend of mine at Chalmers. She hasn't published this yet. Uh, this is in a, inside a piston engine. So if you're unfamiliar with optical engines, the way they work is uh, you know, normally there's the, the engine head with the valves in it, and then just below it there will be a, a gap with some windows, okay? And then there's a piston with a window in the, in the top. It's usually made out of uh, quartz. So you can see through the piston. Now the piston's on a big extender. So the piston goes up and down, but it's this really long thing with a mirror sticking in the middle of it. The mirror does not go up and down. It sits at 45 degrees, so this piston goes up and down, and you can see into the engine by looking through that uh, mirror. So what she did is she sent a plane of laser light across the, through the window in the top and looked through the mirror, through the piston. So this is the uh, fuel spray coming down from the injector, and it was hit by the laser light, so you get me scattering from the spray. But you see there's extremely strong Rayleigh scattering because the truth is usually, especially larger hydrocarbons, have a much different Rayleigh cross-section than air does. This is actually a very simple way to image uh, the vapor and, and actually uh, measure the uh, distribution of fuel-air ratios in a piston engine. There's one way to do it. And I just said all that. So. I didn't want to talk much more about Rayleigh. I thought we'd t spend some time on Raman. So we solved this Lorentz atom problem, which is very crude. Um, we talked about how an electric field can induce a dipole, and there's a polarizability. So that's how susceptible is this molecule to, to the effect of the electric field, and how, much, how strong a dipole can we produce by the interaction with the electric field. And the macroscopic material polarization is an ensemble of these polarization states in the individual molecules, and they give rise to the scattered light. So a classical way to look at Raman scattering is uh, similar to the Rayleigh treatment. You think of scattering as excitation via this polarizability and then re-radiation in the torus pattern. And, and it's true that uh, Raman scattering is polarized fairly cleanly. So the scattering process is really fast, and the optical interaction is really only with the electron cloud. So Rayleigh and Raman scattering are sort of similar to each other. They're both just, they're not interacting with the total molecule, they're interacting with this high-speed electron cloud. Uh, Rayleigh scattering is related to uh, a sort of a static electron cloud. In other words, uh, the, the electron doesn't have a signature embedded in it. It's just within this probability distribution, and the electric field comes along and has an effect on it. And that's the, uh, that's the excitation part, and that effect then causes the scattering of light, almost like a, uh, a small antenna giving off light. But the Raman uh, scattering is caused by a, an an electron cloud that actually has something going on in it already. And as I said before, I mean, this actually only makes sense if you think about it. We show these static pictures of a potential well when we do the LIF pictures, right? Well, the electrons are extremely fast. They are what produce the uh, potential well that, that uh, produces the bonding in the molecule. But they, they are also, I mean, they're actually present because of the presence of the neutrons, or the nuclei, I mean right, positively charged nuclei are the reason that they're in this region. And so the motion of those positively charged nuclei will be embedded in this, this membrane or this, this electron cloud. So there's a signature of the motion of the nuclei in the electron cloud, and that's what Raman scattering is. It's scattering from that signature. So we write the polarizability in this form 
we say there's an alpha zero and then there's the alpha dq times q. Q is the normal coordinate of the vibrational mode. Just going like that. So this alpha zero is the Rayleigh polarizability and this gives rise to the Raman signal. This is a, an old fashioned classical way of looking at this problem. So in a very simple minded way of looking at it, we assume a diatomic molecule and we say that the nuclei are vibrating in simple harmonic motion. That was the first order solution we had to vibration the other day. Okay, so we can say then that Q is equal to Q0 cosine of the vibrational frequency times time. And we can say the electric field is also uh, a sinusoidal or cosinusoidal. And we take, we just use that expression where there's an E and there's a Q. And we get this, there's a, there's a Rayleigh term and then there's a Raman term and the sum and difference frequencies are what give rise to these bands. That's why we use this analogy to, to mixing. It follows the same idea. Now there's, uh, there's a book about that thick that's actually on, on uh, quantum mechanical treatments for Raman <laughs> scattering. So it, uh, the book doesn't just have this over and over again. So what I gave you was a, uh, uh, a hand-waving argument. For Rayleigh scattering, the energy of the incoming photon has the same uh, as the redirected outgoing photon. But in the case of Raman, there's energy exchange. Now, okay, this, this picture, there's an error in this, pa in this page too. Can you find it? It's not anti-Stokes. I didn't draw an anti-Stokes arrow. I drew a Stokes shift. Sorry, scratched out. <laughs> okay, in this case, there's no energy exchange. We're not going to actually uh, uh, change the populations. The, the, the molecule is not actually going to like absorb energy from this thing. It's just going to scatter. But if you think about it, the photons have actually got a different energy than they came in with. So somehow energy has to be conserved, right? That's a simple concept in freshman physics. But the truth is, the energy gets spread out in the Stokes and anti-Stokes modes and in the end it all adds up without losing energy or creating energy. The scattering amplitudes aren't so simple as I've been implying. Uh, the polarizability is a tensor. We have to think about all the polarization orientations like I talked about before. But the Raman shifts, those changes in frequencies really are just sum and difference frequencies. So there is a Platzik polarizability theory that you can go through. Uh, there are different ways to handle these problems. The, this would be called a semi-classical uh, solution where you use a classical description of the electromagnetic wave and then a quantum description for the molecule. And that's what Platzik polarizability is. Uh, and that's what's in this uh, big book by Long. I, I put that in the, the, list, the reading list if you're interested in reading about Raman. So that's how you actually deal with this, but it's really going to, it's going to deal more with the amplitudes of the uh, polarizability and orientations and so forth. This, this business of uh, sum and difference frequencies doesn't actually go away. So the outcome includes selection rules. So in Raman, uh, you can see Raman from delta V equals plus one and delta J equals plus or minus two. Not all vibrational modes are Raman active. Depends on one of those inner products that I was talking about the other day. You get a quantum mechanical inner product and this thing can't cancel itself out. So the final spaced average form uh, is fairly simple. If we're going to collect the signal at 90 degrees to the laser beam, it looks like this where PR is the scattered Raman power. This is the incident power. N is the number density of those species that are going to scatter. This is the Raman cross-section, which is uh, a function of wavelength, and that's where all the serious physics went, times the solid angle, the uh, interaction length, and an efficiency taking into account you know, all that other stuff like uh, reflections that uh, collector lens faces and all that stuff. So that's fairly simple, and in fact, if you go to Ekbreth's book, he, uh, Ekbreth quotes Long's first book. There's a new book out 
uh, long wrote a new book, which is much newer than that. But Eckbreth took these from the uh, the old long book, and you can just look these things up if you want to. These these different species have Raman active modes in these regions, uh, and these are the cross sections at different wavelengths of light. But often the signal is just calibrated, like I said before. You there's something in there that you know is an absolute measurement, and you just use that. So this is, a, I showed you this before, this is from, we had only about 300 millijoules per pulse at best uh, when we did this, um, and so this was in a flame. What we were really doing was trying to figure out how do you make Raman measurements in a flame that has a lot of droplets inside it and a lot of hydrocarbons as well. And polarization is one way to get rid of a lot of the trouble that you run into. So um, in this case, as I said last time, there's a big nitrogen peak. You can use that to scale all the other peaks because we know the concentration of nitrogen. And you see these other peaks in here. I'm going to show you some much nicer looking results later on from Sandia. And uh, in here is where this, a lot of CH action is. And they've actually done a really nice job of, of sort of separating all that out and looking at different hydrocarbon species as well. But they do it by using three different spectrometers and three different imaging systems and so forth. You know, that's Sandia. You just apply dollars and make it happen. <laughs> and there it is. So this is in Rob Barlow's laboratory. Maybe you've met him or heard of him. He, he is the uh, person who started the turbulent non premix flame workshop, does a lot of work in flames. Uh, and this is, this is his setup. And so you see these are all Raman lasers. Well, no, there's three Raman lasers and a, and a, uh, a lift laser. No, that's the lift laser, four Raman lasers. Uh, and the flame sits here. And then these are the analysis sections. So he's got actually, so there are several different, this is, a, this is a lift laser and that's a lift laser. One of them is for OH lift and the other one's used for other things. At the time I, uh, uh, developed this presentation, he was doing carbon monoxide, C-O-L-I-F as well. So as I said before, uh, you don't want to uh, use uh, pulses that have too much intensity, which is why he's got four lasers, and, and he combines them into a string uh, so that he gets a, a large number of photons crossing across the flame, but not, not such an intense pulse that he's going to, you know, drill mirrors or... Uh, have it break down in the flame or something like that. So in their flames, they uh, are measuring, with Raman, they're measuring nitrogen, oxygen, methane, CO2, water, hydrogen, and CO. That's an interesting one. The hydrogen molecule has a gigantic Raman cross-section. So this thing that you can't normally see other ways, actually, a lot of times, you can see it with Raman, which is fortunate. And they get spatial resolution along the line that they're measuring, around 100 microns in diameter, that is. And uh, they do it across a 6 uh, millimeter segment of flame. They actually they image that, that 6 millimeters into a spectrometer. So they're looking at locations along the 6 millimeters. So this is the 6 millimeters. They're exciting Raman along that line. Okay, And then... Uh, so what they do is they use an imaging spectrometer, so that produces an image, right? So along one axis, that's that line, and on the other axis, it's the spectrum. And so you can, there are multiple species along the spectrum at each position along the laser beam. And what they really want to know is where are they with respect to the flame front at every single time they make a measurement. And so they have two crossed OH PLIF measurements at the same time. And by crossing the OH PLIF, they actually have a three-dimensional uh, representation of where the flame is right at the line. So, so the crossing between the two planes happens right at the line. So then they know the flame normal with respect to that line, right? Because they've got these two other images. So, that, so they know that the, the flame is actually moving that way and the line's right there. That way they can get conditional statistics on the flame, which is what you really need to know. So they have this very fast mechanical shutter. We were just talking about that. Their shutter is like this, you ever hear what, a, you know what a Rube Goldberg machine is? It's like this crazy invention with all these parts and stuff. This thing has got like a, a, a disc with a hole in it that's moving fast this way, another disc with another hole in it going fast this way, and I think there's a third one, and these things all have to line up, so you have to get the phasing of these motors 
This thing is screaming along too. I mean, it's like making a breeze in your laboratory. And, uh, and, and you have to get all these holes to line up exactly right. I've always had this idea that, that I just mentioned that this optical Kerr effect time gate I talked about when I talked about ballistic imaging, if you could use that as the gate for a Raman system, then the same shaped pulse that produced the Raman would produce the gate. So the gate would never be open outside of the pulse of the Raman. But well, I've never tried it, but that might be uh, another way to do that. But anyway, with Raman, you have to really turn up the gain. And if you have a lot of background noise, a lot of background emission, it's going gonna, it's gonna to flood the Raman signals. And so you do have to reject as much background as you can possibly imagine. And, and so that's why a very, very short shutter. Then what they do within the spectrometer, they bin the spectral signals uh, in blocks and integrate across the Raman features to maximize the signal. And I'll show you what that means in a moment. So then the bin signals are related to species concentration and temperature. They use a combination of modeling and calibration. What do I mean by that? Well, it's, uh, it's unfortunate that you can't get this on the web anymore, but the University of, uh, the Technical University of Darmstadt uh, developed this code called Ramses, which was a, it was a little bit like lift based but it was a really nice model of Raman spectra. It had a lot of information about the different Raman bands and so forth, and, and you could use it to, to synthesize Raman spectra. They felt uncomfortable about it, though, because they were really unsure about the, the hydrocarbon part of it, and so they thought, eh. so they pulled it back off the web. We, we've used it, my group has used it in the past, and it's been really useful, but, uh, you know, it's, it's their code if they don't want to... If, they don't want it, if they're nervous about it and they don't want it out there, then okay. But Sandia uses Ramses to sort of guide uh, their, their calibrations. And so what they'll do is they'll do very careful calibration. You know, a, a, a molecule like CO, for example, you can certainly generate some fairly warm CO, just of known concentration, get the Raman signals. You can get some of those, and then you can, then you can like use that together with Ramses to sort of scale and calibrate all the different bins which is what they do. And this measurement is often combined with LIF. They've been doing CO LIF. That's a two-photon process we haven't really talked about, but um, CO has a, a, an absorption that's out in the uh, vacuum ultraviolet. You know, by vacuum ultraviolet, that means that your light doesn't propagate if there's no vacuum. And so, of course, you can't just send laser beams of that wavelength across the room. So what you do is uh, um, you, you send two pulses in that are twice that wavelength, and there is a mixing process that will occur that causes that same kind of transition, although it's very weak. So molecules will have a two-photon cross-section in addition to a one-photon cross-section. And then you get LIF from that. But then you need to also know what are the quenchers and so on. And that, so the Raman is used in this case to scale the, uh, the uh, COLIF signal to the quenchers. The, the thing about a two-photon process, and part of the reason I didn't talk about it in this class is you have to be very careful because this is an extremely weak, any two-photon cross-section is extremely weak. And you have to be very careful when you do this kind of a measurement, a two-photon LIF, because uh, it's a nonlinear process, which means you really have to crank the laser power up and you can accidentally photolyze carbon dioxide and produce CO. So you'll end up producing the thing that you're trying to measure and you'll corrupt your signal. So you have to be very careful how you do it. So here's some results where we're looking at temperature from the Raman signals as a function of position where that's the center of the jet. Uh, and this is for a near homogeneous uh, jet flame and this is for an inhomogeneous jet flame. In other words, non-premixed and partially premixed. Uh, and they're looking at temperature as a function of position, and, and that's the uh, mixture fraction. They, they publish a huge amount of statistics, and what's nice about this kind of work is they're actually they're producing quantitative results, and, and that forces the modelers to not do too much tuning and see if they can actually reproduce the quantitative results as opposed to just getting trends. But it's, you have to go to a, an awful lot of work to get responsible quantitative results. They've made some re improvements recently. The Raman signals are weak, uh, and their in interferences can be big, uh, like C2 swan bands I mentioned. 
The binning system they use is not spectrally resolved, and, and, and as I pointed out, in, the reason I showed you my crappy uh, Raman picture was to show you really how crappy the, the hydrocarbon section is, and how you, you have to really work at it to get some nice results. Now you'll see some nice results. The Raman signals are strongly polarized. Fluorescence interference and flame luminosity is unpolarized, so use polarizers. I'm happy to say they got that idea from my paper. Uh, now they use simultaneous detection of orthogonal polarization components. So here we're looking at average spectra, okay? So if we look here at the black, that's the vertical polarization experiment. The red dotted line is experiment in the horizontal polarization, and so the gray line is the difference between them. And then uh, this other, whatever that color is, what do you call that color? That's Ramsey's. So, so what you see is, is that in these gray regions, they're getting much better. If you look at the gray, the, Ramsey's is obviously not exactly right. I, mean, I guess that's why they don't share it. But uh, like there's, th there's this thing here. I'm not sure what that is. Um, no, that's right there. There's one over here that, yeah, that's correct. Actually, those are right on top of each other. So I take it back. Ramsey's is doing a very good job. Right here, it's not. I wonder what happened there. It's not reproducing that one. Anyway, um, you can see that it's still useful for calibrating the bins. Here are the bins. This spectral region here is a C2 bin. This region here is a CO2. That's how they do the binning on their uh, chip so they can get much stronger uh, signals. So this is an average signal over a long period of time. When they're taking the turbulent flame measurements, they can't do that. It has to be single shot, and then they do it in the bins. And, and this shows you what the bins are. So look at there. There's methane. Looking fairly clean now. Their normal spectrometer has fairly low spectral resolution. Okay, so here's a hydrocarbon spectrum in that uh, spectrometer. So uh, there's DME, methane, ethane, whatever. Oh. <laughs> Forget it. Anyway, they made a second imaging spectrometer, which has much better resolution just for that CH region. Okay, and now you're seeing extremely nice looking uh, spectra all separated now so they can bin those, separate it out so they can bin those different components uh, and see their contribution as well. So they, they basically have three spectrometer systems all running at the same time, single shot each time capturing these spectra. And I'm going to stop there, we'll take a break. <laughs> And then we'll come back and talk about cars. So think about, do you want to do cars all in one big blast? It's a longer lecture, but it's just a lecture. We could do it all in one blast and then not have a third lecture, or we can break in the middle. But let's take a break now, and then we'll come back.